Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Mike Marshall. Mike Marshall spent more than 15 years working in the planning and zoning departments of cities in both Texas and California, working within the entitlement space on development projects ranging from 1,200 lot residential subdivisions to office buildings and even a 1.4 million square foot TV and movie studio campus along the way. All of that before starting Tolosa Property Group, a real estate consulting firm that helps investors with properties suffering from decreased cash flow, deflated property value, or unrealized development potential by implementing highly specialized forced appreciation strategies to turn around their underperforming properties. Mike endeavors to live by the Zig Ziglar quote, you will get all you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. As such, Mike now focuses on using his knowledge, skills, and experience to improve the businesses of investors from all asset classes, all from his home in North Texas. So can you give us a little bit about how did you get started in doing land deals? Yeah, absolutely. I started in real estate. I didn't really start. My father started in real estate. And so my first experience was like a 12-year-old kid picking up shingles from re-roofing projects and things like that. And I was very much into helping him when I was a kid. And that was my first exposure to real estate. But then fast forward to after college, I got a job um, at a local city in a completely unrelated um, profession, essentially, but I was always um, interested still in real estate. And there was this whole profession called urban planning, your planning and zoning office, essentially. And so I started working in that office and I started working in jurisdictions in California and Texas. And ultimately what happened is I ended up helping some of the people that I was um, helping as in my job, I was helping them on other projects in other cities. So I started consulting with them. I built a consulting business to the point where I could step out on my own. And then from there, I started doing my own deals as well as helping on the consulting side as well. That is absolutely incredible. And your bio says that you were in Texas and California. Now you're in North Texas. How did you make that leap? Yeah, we from California, we came to the Austin area probably around 2007 or so. And then we ended up moving back to California, just a lot of family stuff going on. We ended up moving back. And we had kids and we wanted to give our kids a different kind of life than what we were experiencing in the busy part of California. So now we are um, east of Dallas, probably about half hour. And it's a lot calmer, which is nice. Awesome. Welcome back to Texas. Yeah. Uh, so can you talk to us a little bit about how did you learn to do the specific types of deals that you specialize in? Did you have a mentor? Did you have a coach? Yeah, honestly, it was like on the job training, essentially. So when I was working for those jurisdictions, I was processing those projects from the public employee side of the equation. But I always had the mindset as an investor, and I always would look at it and I'd see this gap. There was this disconnect between investors and developers and then the planning office. And it was like, they didn't know what I knew kind of thing. And yet planners that I worked with didn't have an investor mindset at all. And so I was just able to take these this knowledge that I had and apply it to the benefit of these investors and developers. And so I just would see opportunities where a lot of people didn't. And that's like the secret sauce is that we're able to go in to a variety of jurisdictions and really find where these hidden opportunities essentially are at. Yeah, I love that. So drawing on your professional experience, bridging that gap, talk to us a little about your very first land deal as an investor where you were able to apply all of this knowledge? Sure. The very first land deal I did, I was just saying to myself, I had my consulting business going and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to try to flip a lot and see what happens. And there was just one of these desert lots in Kern County, California. And I remember it very distinctly because I ended up selling it to this lady that wanted to use it for filming purposes. And she wanted to do all sorts of like explosions and stuff like that out there. And, and she wanted to do it before buying the property, which was really interesting too. And so as my first foray into the whole land flipping thing, I'm like, man, is every one of these going to be as interesting and colorful as this one? <laughs> and so that was kind of like my first foray. That wasn't any, like, there was no forced appreciation or subdivisions in that one. But moving forward from there, my first one was a four lot subdivision um, in um, like a rural area of a local city. And it was basically 14 acres. We split it into four lots. And there's some things that you can do in California when you do four lots or fewer, where you can streamline the process that a lot of people don't know about. And we were able to do that really quickly. Wow, that's incredible. And so do you remember the numbers on that subdivide deal? 
Yeah, gosh, that was quite a while ago. But I think the way that it, if I remember right, the way that it worked is that the 14 acres actually ended up costing, I think the price was probably about $550,000. And then in that one, we were trying to always target like a two and a half multiplier on that investment, essentially. And we got really close to it. We were like a little bit over two times on it. And there's things that we could have done better to make more on it. Ultimately, we could have like negotiated down a little bit more, things like that. But um, that was our first one that we did. And that one worked out really well. And that just parlayed into other ones. And so we would do these deals either as a consultant at times, and then sometimes we do it as an owner and principal in the deal. And so we'd serve different roles as times went on. Yeah. So whenever you are were looking for these types of deals, were you essentially acquiring them by uh, partnering with your consulting clients or were you actually going out and finding these properties? Yeah, it was a combination of things. So I would go out and find them and then I'd go back to my consulting clients because I know they had deeper pockets at the time. And so I could definitely go after them and I use that. So I had one gentleman that was an owner of a mortgage company that was trying to do his own investments and development projects. And there was another gentleman who um, owned a local Remax office and a law firm. And so those were my first two people that I worked with and it catapulted from there. Yeah, that's very cool. So you've made in the, at this point in your journey, you've made the decision. I'm going to start doing my own deals as an investor right. and I'm going to start looking for properties. Now, obviously you had this knowledge and experience that you could see opportunity where a lot of other people couldn't, right? So how did you go about looking for these properties that could make a potential value add type deal? Sure. Very first off the beginning, it was really like off the MLS and then making, um, having relationships with local realtors. That was the way that we first started. And that's what we do still today in large part. And so that was the major push was in that. And so we just would create relationships with them. We find properties that were listed and we would try to find out like, okay, how can we improve it? How could we do something to force appreciation or why is this property sitting there? And then trying to fix the problem. And that was our approach. And we did that for quite a long time before we got into doing direct mail and all those kinds of things. And now where we're at today is that we really don't do any of that outbound marketing. It's a, other than trying to create more relationships, but a lot of it is inbound from different, different relationships that we've established. Yeah. Relationships. I was just having a conversation about this the other day. Relationships, really the lifeblood of our business, whether it's on the buyer or the seller side, relationships are super important. Can you talk to us a little bit about if someone is listening to this and they may not know the term forced appreciation, can you talk to us through that and what that actually means and how you approach it? Yeah. So there's two different types of appreciation. The one that we're used to is like market-wide appreciation. So we buy our house, we sit and wait, and it goes up in value, hopefully. So that's like market-wide appreciation, the rising tide floats all boats concept. And then in forced appreciation, it's different. We're not relying really on what's happening in the market so much. We just know that there's strategies that we can implement proactively to increase the value of the property. So it doesn't necessarily matter so much what's happening in the market. You still have to consider it, of course, but we're not relying on the market-wide appreciation to get that money out of it. We're able to go in ultimately, and this is a big part of it, is that we're able to go in and actually buy these properties closer to retail value than you would maybe under a traditional like land flipping situation. It really is a situation where there's really two different businesses. Ultimately, there's a clear dividing line because the strategy and the mindset is different. With land flipping, you're trying to get the best deal you can and then sell at or close to retail, which is perfect and great. And then you have the other side of it, which is where I'm at, which is you're looking for these opportunities to force appreciation. And it's not a perfect situation by any means, but it allows you to offer more than what you would be otherwise. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. When I first heard the term, when I was back when I was a baby investor and I heard that you could force appreciation on properties, my mind exploded because it was like, okay, if it does, if a property doesn't fit this buy super cheap and then sell close to retail model, then maybe there's an opportunity to still save the deal and still create something out of this deal by forcing appreciation. So what would be some different scenarios, some of the most common scenarios that you see uh, that you can employ to force appreciation on properties? Sure. So I think there's two buckets. There's the 
bucket that's the operational side. And you'll see that in commercial and multifamily development or for projects a lot where you're trying to raise the rent or you're trying to decrease the expenses. You're moving the needle that way to increase the net operating income. And that's very valid. And it's a strong strategy. It's done all throughout the industry. And then there's the other side of it, which is the physical improvement side of it. And that's really where I sit. And that's looking at situations where maybe you have an existing commercial or multifamily building, but there's some land area off to the side of it that's not being utilized. And maybe you can add more units or you can add RV parking or boat parking or something like that, where you can add value or even more, you know, realistically for us. And what we do is we're really more looking at vacant land and seeing how we can actually go about adding value that way. And so it typically comes down to three different types of projects more often than not. It's either a site plan review where you're getting approval of a site plan, let's say for a multifamily development or commercial development, or it's a subdivision or it's a zone change and or a combination of those three. Those are the, the typical ones. And there's other lesser types that are more nuanced, but those are the big three. Excellent. Let's dive into the zone change strategy. Um, can you talk to us about what that looks like? What also, essentially what's the the major overarching theme of that particular strategy? Sure. The major theme really is that as we're used to looking at, let's say, recreational land or even houses, we're valuing a property based on comps, right? And so we're all familiar with that. But when you're looking at, let's say, vacant land for development purposes, it's really is more valued off of what the final product could actually be on the property. If it's a single family home, that's going to be one valuation. If it's going to be a multifamily development, that's going to be a different valuation. And theoretically, the more intense of a use that you could get on any piece of property, you're going to push the value of that property as a result. And so that's why you're actually getting, that's why you're actually adding value to it is because you're changing that approved or allowed land use. And so the best way I can explain it to you is give you an example. There was one that we were working on that we were just talking about before the call started, where basically it was four pieces of property all adjacent to each other, all zoned agricultural. And we've just recently got approval where we changed the zoning to multifamily. That's a big jump. Usually you don't go agricultural to multifamily. You usually do like agricultural to low density residential or something like that. But the circumstances surrounding it justify doing that. And by doing so, you're changing the allowable land use. And then you're actually allowing now, instead of just being like a single family home, now I could have a 200 unit apartment building on there. And so the revenue that's generated from that use when it's all said and done actually increases the value of the property in the end. And so it's changing the use. It's changing what's allowed. That's what adds the value. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how long does it typically take that process to actually change zoning from, say, agricultural to a multifamily use or something like that? Sure. So regarding timeframes and fees and those kind of things, it does vary very much based on the jurisdiction that you're in. To give you an idea, there was one that we were working on um, or one of our students was working on in Tennessee. He got, did that zone change in a matter of a couple of months and it was zero dollars. It was a very rural area. It didn't cost them anything. So it was really simple. There was one that I was helping somebody with in Michigan and that took three or four months and it was an application fee of $750. So that's the middle ground. And then there's ones that I've done in you know California that'll take 12 to 18 months and it's $40,000 to go through the application process. Wow. So it's very much like jurisdiction or, or location specific in that regard. So when we're trying to pick ideal targets, yeah, that's a big part of it is getting an idea for what that process looks like. And then that's where my experience comes in is really being able to streamline that and make it go as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. Okay. So can you talk about what are some, give us some examples of what a, a rezoning force appreciation might look like in terms of the numbers. So it was worth yeah. this before, and now it's worth that now. So again, just using that example as referring to the agricultural, the multifamily, I'll use that as an example, but just understand that this one is pretty extraordinary. It's not the norm, but in that example, it took us probably six to seven months to go through the rezoning process. And the current value of the property, all four of them combined was I think about 1.8 million for all four of them. And then the total valuation after the rezoning is approved, not the site plan, but just the rezoning itself, 
that actually changed the value to where I think it was 3.2 million. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. And talking about the norm, what is some of the, what are some of the norms that you see? That was an extraordinary case. Can you yeah. give us an example of what a normal case might yeah. be? Yeah, absolutely. So like a more normalized one might be one that's, let's say it's zoned for R1. So it's zoned for a single family. Let me change it. Actually, you have a single family house that's zoned for multifamily, let's say. That is not a zone change situation, but it is still what we'd call an underutilized property. It could be like a, a multifamily building, but it's really right now is a single family house. That's what we would call a site plan review, where we go in and get the site plan approved for the actual re, uh, multifamily development. Something like that would do like a significant bump. So if it was a single family house, and then we ended up getting, um, there was one in particular I can think of where it was a single family house. There was, then it was getting approved for 14 townhomes. The single family house sold to us for $850,000 then the total valuation once that site plan was approved went to 1.25 if i remember right so that's much more modest but it still was a significant bump for us to be able to make it worth it and that was a site plan review that wasn't a zone change a lot of zone changes will add more values when you're looking at biggest bang for the buck that's certainly in the zone change arena that's where you're going to get your biggest bump and we'll probably see some that are you know in the realm of maybe I don't know, mid six figures, something like that in terms of profit, that's pretty typical. Wow. But again, you're dealing with a little bit more complication, right? Because that's the other element of this is that there is very much a, a political element that comes into it because to get these approvals, you're going before the planning commission and city council, and you may get opposition from the public, things like that. So there are some things that you have to certainly overcome. Yeah, that definitely doesn't sound as, as simple as throwing a property under contract and then just wholesaling it out. Right? Exactly. No, it certainly isn't, but you can certainly, you can, there's things that you can do to make it like easier. And we're talking a little bit bigger ones, but there's ones that are more like subtle that you can do those kind of things with too. But you mentioned site plan review. For those of us that are listening to this and have never heard of that, can you talk to us about what that is? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So a site plan is basically imagine if you're like if you have a drone and you're looking down on your property, right? And instead of it being like a photo, it does an actual engineered drawing. So it's showing like the property lines. It's going to show the, the proposed building footprints. It's going to show the setbacks from the property lines to the building. It's going to show parking stalls. It's going to show maybe air conditioning units. It's going to show all of the improvements to the property on this one plan as if you're doing a, a downward look from a drone and it's a drawing, like I said. And so that's a proposed site plan and it has to meet a whole myriad of different standards, architecture, landscaping, parking, you know, lot size requirements, all sorts of things like that have to be met. And those are all things that are reviewed by the county or the city. And ultimately what you're trying to get to is a site plan that's been refined enough that it meets all the city standards and then it gets approved and then the next person in line, the developer or builder could come in and actually get like the engineering permits and then the building permits and actually build the property. Got it. Got it. So if someone's listening to this and they're saying, you know what, I, I've had several uh, deals under my belt, whether it's flipping land or wholesaling land, and I'm really interested in getting started with uh, some zone changes. Uh, what would you advise them to do? How would they go about finding the types of deals that would work for that particular um, type of deal? Sure. I think there's some tips that I could give you. One of them is if you've ever looked at a zoning map, there's all these different colors, right? And these different colors represent different zones. And where the opportunities tend to be is where you see two zones butting up against each other. You might see red and yellow right next to each other. The red might be commercial. The yellow might be residential of some kind. Generally speaking, you have a better chance of getting properties rezoned when the, the zoning that you're trying to zone to is located next to the property or across the street or very close proximity. And without them approving it that way, if they were to approve like these properties to change the zoning where it's not adjacent to the current zoning you're trying to go to, it ends up being something they call spot zoning. And spot zoning is imagine you just have a commercial lot in the middle of a bunch of residential areas. That's something that they try to avoid as much as possible because it just creates inconsistent planning, inconsistent development patterns, 
And so they really try to do the best they can to stay away from that. And so if you're like on a single family zoned lot, but you're located right across the street from a multifamily zoned lot, you have a good chance of, you know, upzoning that property to resident or to multifamily in that example. Proximity is a big thing for sure too. Um, the other thing to look at is really, you look at the current zoning, but every jurisdiction has a future land use plan that's part of their comprehensive plan or sometimes called their general plan. That land use plan is going to look at and see what the city or the county wants to, that property to be zoned 5, 10, 15 years down the road. While it might be zoned right now for residential, in that future land use plan, it may say that it's really identified as commercial. If you go in and you're going to try to rezone that property, you want to try to be in line with their future land use plan the best that you can, because now you're not now you're going to be consistent with that. You're consistent with their vision and you're just bringing it through to fruition. You might wonder why the city doesn't rezone it themselves. And generally speaking, jurisdictions won't rezone properties on their own unless there's some sort of compelling reason for them to do it. And the market and what the market's doing is not really a compelling enough reason for them. So they'll let stuff sit and it just becomes inefficient. That makes a lot of sense. So let's say someone's brand new to this. They are hearing this and they're saying, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to look for two zones that are close to, that are butting up against each other. Where do they find that information? Where can they see like a zone map, for example? Sure. So if you go to most jurisdictions, you can say city of Dallas, GIS, interactive mapping. You can just Google that and they'll usually pull up their GIS map for that jurisdiction. And so it doesn't just exist in big cities. It's a most cities will have that kind of mapping system available to it. And then ultimately in that plan, there'll be a layer where you can turn on the zoning layer. And that's the best scenario when you find that kind of tool that's available to you. And matter of fact, we use the local GIS more often than we do some of the other tools that are common within the space, just because they'll have more accurate information, it's more timely, et cetera. And then I'd say that even to that extent too, if we're just looking at markets to try to go into, if they don't have good interactive mapping systems, sometimes we'll just walk away from that jurisdiction completely just because it's an indicator of how advanced they are. It's an indicator of maybe how easy it's going to be to get information and get stuff done. Unless there's a compelling deal in that jurisdiction, we'll top, a lot of times we'll walk away from it and just go to the next one that has a better system for us to do the research on. That's where you would want to go to get the zoning information right then and there. As far as the future land use plan, the on the zoning and planning's website, they'll oftentimes will have a link to that comprehensive plan. And then inside of that document, you'll find the future land use plan. Excellent. Would the strategy be to uh, look for areas on this GIS map, look for uh, those specific qualities that you just mentioned, and then look for on-market deals in that area? Or how would you go about sourcing your very first zone change type property. So you certainly could do that where you go and you create your hit list and you have a list of the properties and the property owner information and that kind of thing. And you could create your own, you know, direct mail campaign. You could certainly do that for sure. But this is a much more a laser focused approach. You're not casting the wide net. This is more the sniper approach to everything. And so typically what we would say is that we would go and get a local um, agent and we'll actually talk to them about, hey, here's the targets that we're looking at. And we're going to ask them to either do one of two things, either one, approach the owner directly with an unsolicited offer. That's one way to go. Or the other way to go, which is works pretty well, too, is that you go have the agent look up who the agent was that sold the property to the current owner. They already have a current and existing relationship with that person from their past business that they've done. So we'll actually have our agent work through their agent to get an offer to them because there's already an established level of trust that's there. And I'm not trying to just be Mike off the street kind of guy with some offer. It's going to come from somebody that they know and trust. And that's why we'll do it that way a lot of times. Yeah, that's a really good piece of advice. So if someone's looking for these types of deals, let's say they find a deal, they're working with an agent can they pay up to retail price or what sort of your criteria for how much you'll pay for a property based on what you can get out of it after the zone change? And how do you go about finding that information? So we'll essentially try to, again, at least two and a half X what we're doing as far as our investment. That's the goal for pretty much anything. But a lot of times what we'll do is we'll actually go and get um, an appraisal done. 
So we'll pay for the couple thousand dollars for the appraisal. And what the appraiser will do is they'll give you two things. They're going to give you the current valuation of the property as is, as they normally would with an appraisal. But then they'll also create a hypothetical valuation based on the rezoning of the property. So you're going to get this document, this appraisal that comes back, that's going to basically be a before and after picture of what the valuation of the property could be. And so that's usually what we use as our basis, and, and we'll use that as justification, but then we'll also work with brokers that are connected, say, to multifamily developers or whatever, and we'll work with them on trying to establish a proposed valuation too. But the really what it is, that appraisal is like a, a first step or a first glance to make sure, okay, is this really worth moving forward with or not? You could go and use the broker instead of the appraisal, but we like using the appraisal because it's just something that's a little bit more tangible and solid at that point. Yeah, that's great. And so what at what point do you get an appraisal in that particular process? I'm sure you're not just paying thousands of dollars for appraisals on every potential property. But at what stage do you do that in? Yeah, great question. You know, we go through all of our due diligence steps and then what we'll do is we'll get the property under contract. And then the one difference too is like I said, the one downside to some entitlements is that it takes longer. And so one of those areas, though, that's really helpful to create more time is in that due diligence process. So instead of us looking for 30 days or 45 days of due diligence, we're out like 90 days or sometimes even longer. During that due diligence period is when we're actually paying the money for that appraisal to get done. Got it. So you lock it up under contract first, and then part of your due diligence is getting the appraisal. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about your due diligence process? What types of things are you doing during that particular phase mm -hmm. um, of, of that process? Yeah, absolutely. So we do this for our clients too, where we're looking at a property and we're saying like, hey, what's the potential of this property from a variety of different angles? And I was mentioning before, the three buckets that we look at more often is like subdivision, site plan review, and then rezoning. And we'll look at other opportunities too, but we're going to look at the property and look at it from an opportunity perspective. What are the opportunities that are there? And then we're going to look at it in the terms of what are the constraints that are associated to the property. And so those are the two sides of the due diligence from uh, for our perspective. And we have a due diligence checklist that we use, everybody else does, but it goes through everything from what's the current zoning of the property, um, what's the adjacent zoning of the property, what's the current allowable land uses, what are the allowable land uses of the adjacent properties. This is stuff that we're doing specifically for rezoning. Um, if it's stuff for a subdivision, we're looking at, okay, what's the minimum lot size? What's the minimum lot frontage? What's the uh, maximum allowable density? That's something that's applicable in more urban settings than it is like in rural land. But so these are some of the things that we're looking at. And so we're going through that due diligence process before we get all under contract. So once we have a series of green lights and we're feeling good about our due diligence, then at that point, we're going to set up a meeting with the um, local jurisdiction for what they call a pre-application meeting. And the goal of that is to be able to really identify any red flag issues that we didn't catch as part of our due diligence and then see if it's a, something that we can actually uh, mitigate and be willing to move forward with. Hey there, land fans. If you're enjoying this episode and would like to see more episodes like this, please be sure to let us know by liking and subscribing below. Excellent. It sounds like there's a lot of different steps in, in the due diligence process once you lock up this property under contract. What are uh, some typical uh, deposits that you're seeing for these types of deals? Is it 5%, 10%? What's industry standard for these kinds of deals? Oh, this for um, earnest money? Yes. Yeah, probably two and a half to three percent. These are bigger dollars sometimes, so that's really what is does the apply. So that's usually typical. Got it. Okay. And is this is this money refundable? Let's say you hit a red light yeah. and you're like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> we just dropped a, a few hundred thousand here on this property, and now it's not going to work. So how how does that work for you guys? Yeah. So the way that we'll do that is say, all right, if our total earnest money deposit, I don't know, is like $50,000, let's say, what we'll do is we'll make a portion of that due at contract signing. And then we're going to make another portion of it due at another benchmark. And then maybe the last portion due at like closing or something like that. So we're setting up these logical benchmarks and they're usually tied to um, submittal to the city for that proposed project. Once we submit the application, then we're going to have another amount of that due and it's going to go hard accordingly. Ultimately, we're not going to get out like completely free, but if we stage and phase that money in, then we're actually giving us some, some sort of protection. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That's a really great idea. You mentioned earlier, as part of the due diligence process, the sort of two different phases, and you mentioned the constraints that a property may have. Can you give us some examples of what kinds of constraints uh, are possible? Sure. So there's the ones that a lot of you are already, you know, familiar with, you know, wetlands and FEMA floodway stuff, maybe topography. These are all ones that we're all very familiar with being in the land space. But when you start looking at entitlements, there's other things that are coming to play a lot of times too. For example, we think about utilities. And a lot of times we just look at it from the perspective of, is there utilities at the front property line? Yes or no. That's part of the equation. So you hope that they're there. If they're not there, how far away are they? Do I have to pull those utilities to the property? And if so, how much is that going to cost? So those are things to consider. But then also more importantly, is not so much the presence of the utility lines, but it's actually the capacity of the system. And so you may have sewer lines that are there, but is there enough capacity to facilitate your 100 lot proposed subdivision? And sometimes there isn't. And so you may have all the zoning in play to do 100 lots, but there's only capacity for, let's say, 50 lots. And so then your options at that point are to be able to either upgrade the infrastructure or to take a smaller project, at which point you may have to go back in either instance, you have to go back and renegotiate your price. So there's things like that come into play. It might be like environmental stuff. There might be protected tree species. And if you're trying to design, you know, a project, you may have to design around those tree species. Um, So there's things like that. Um, other constraints, like I mentioned, topography and topography, not just in the sense of can you get flat buildable lots, but also in terms of grading quantities and the cost of grading, whether you have to bring dirt off site or you have to bring dirt on site. So you can see how this can quickly get complex when you're getting into some of these development projects. But this is exactly why I really love infill lots, because a lot of this stuff is already addressed when you're looking at infill lots. Already done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, def- with you, definitely get that. So jumping over to subdivisions, mm-hmm. how far do you take your subdivision projects? Do you actually build out infrastructure? Or are you doing more of like a paper subdivide? Mm-hmm. How far will you typically take those subdivision projects? It's a great question because there's different places to jump off the highway. And essentially for what we do is 99% of the time, we're just creating the paper lots and selling it off to a developer. The developer is going to do all the horizontal improvements, all the subsurface utilities, all of that. And then the builder is going to go vertical, put sticks in the ground and actually build, right? And our thing is that we want to be able to just really feed the developer as much as we can, just because that's just not where our expertise is. But if somebody has that expertise or wants to develop that expertise, you can certainly add that into the equation and do just all the horizontal improvements and then sell off these finished lots to a builder And you're going to make more money probably doing it that way. But for us, it's about focusing on our genius, doing the thing that we do well, that we know how to do well, and just keep repeating that as much as possible. Yeah, lean into your lane. I I definitely get that. Whenever you're doing subdivides, are you finding that most of your buyers for your subdivide projects are developers where you're actually, let's say, taking a large, large acreage property, you're subdividing it out on paper and then selling that whole plan to a developer or are you subdividing it on paper maybe cutting up into parcels and then selling off the parcels to individual retail buyers good question so it really does depend on the size and scope of the project and more often than not we try to fly under the radar and do projects that aren't like controversial or really require public notifications or anything like that or public hearings we try to be as quiet as we possibly can so we tend to be where we're selling either to individual people or it's going to be sold to smaller regional type of builders. So not your DR Horton and, and Lennars and all of them. It's going to be some more smaller regional builder that's happy to pick up 5, 10, 15 lots. Got it. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what you mean when you say controversial and some examples sure. of, of what controversial projects might be? Right. Controversial basically is that, you know, whenever you go to a situation where you have to notify the public because of public or because of the requirements allow you to or require you to do that, you're adding this layer of potential scrutiny. And anytime you go to a public hearing, your project is really being reviewed and approved or denied by this five to seven member planning commission or city council board. And so there are ways to mitigate that risk, but there's nearly no way to completely avoid it if you have to go through that process. 
And so what happens is they may notice, they may put a sign on the property. And a lot of you have probably seen this. It'll be like a white or a yellow sign on the property that says, hey, on this date, there's going to be a public hearing. And this is what the project is. And then also people around the property get notified by mail. And so then people can come to the public hearing and then they end up either complaining. You would think that they or hope that they would support your project. But generally speaking, people don't come out to support your project unless you really make an effort to make that happen. But you end up having that risk that there's going to be this opposition. And then there's the risk that you have these um, planning commissioners, city council members that are still political animals and they still are acting on behalf of their constituents. And so sometimes that could be um, problematic and they could actually result in a denial. However, if you go through either minor subdivisions or maybe smaller level major subdivisions, in general, if you meet the requirements that are put out by state subdivision law, there's not a lot of discretion that the planning commission can ultimately have. Their really hands are tied with specifically when it comes to subdivisions. When it comes to things like zone changes and site plan reviews and other stuff, they have a lot more discretion. But if you're just doing a straight up subdivision and it doesn't have a lot of improvements like streets and curbs and gutters and dog parks and rec centers and all that, there's not a lot for them to actually use to deny the project. A lot of people will get scared off understandably because they don't want to deal with the public hearing process. But the reality is that as long as it's not a huge extensive subdivision, then you can get through the process because as long as you're just meeting the, the technical regulations that are at play. Yeah. So you mentioned some political implications. How do you go about navigating the political aspects of these types of deals? Sure. Yeah. It's a difference of if I have the experience and the relationships personally, then I can manage that like myself. However, more often than not, I don't have the relationships. If I'm here in Texas, I don't have a relationship in Florida, you know, or Michigan or wherever else. And so then what we're doing is we're really relying on people on the ground. So it's either the engineer that will end up being that person that has those relationships or in some instances, we'll actually use an attorney or a land use planner that has those relationships and they serve as a, almost like as an advocate for your project or a lobbyist for your project. So having those people that have the relationships on your team becomes really key. And every jurisdiction has like a land use attorney that's processed projects through that jurisdiction that has those relationships. So we'll lean on them if we have to. We don't always use a city attorney or an attorney. Matter of fact, more often than not, we don't use an attorney because we're able to handle all of the stuff without that. But if we need to, we'll definitely do it. Excellent. If someone is interested in getting started in this business, they're listening to this and they say, okay, well, obviously I need to keep my eye on the political uh, aspects of this as well. In addition to engineers and connected real estate attorneys, how can they go about starting to develop those political relationships that would be beneficial to them in their business? Sure. So I would say that you always want to be, no matter what market you're working in, you always want to be looking in your own backyard. You want to be paying attention to what's happening there. So looking at city council and planning commission agendas, understanding what projects are being considered, even watching the hearings on the, on the internet yourself so you can get a sense for what's going on there. These are all really good ideas. Um, and then ultimately, if you want to create those relationships, you're going to have to go and, and meet these people and press the flesh, so to speak. And one of the ways you can do that is a lot of um, city councils and planning commissions, they have um, development subcommittees. And so if there's five people on the planning commission, two or three of them might be on this subcommittee. And you can actually request meetings with them and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what we do. We're looking at doing these kind of projects in this area. I just wanted to introduce myself and get any feedback or thoughts that you guys have. And these are some of the projects that we've done in the past. So it's like an interview in a way, but they're going to meet with you because they have an interest in what goes on in that city, obviously. And that's part of their job, just in terms of being representing their constituents. So that's what you would do if you're local to the actual market. If it's somewhere that's farther out, again, at that point, you're going to really rely on other people's ability to have those relationships in place. That is fantastic. Yeah, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving pieces to this. Yeah, absolutely. But I'd say that there's a place where everybody can start that's manageable because I'm talking like bigger projects and things like that. But there are certain places where you could start with this whole forced appreciation strategy that are, are much more simple and straightforward than when you start out with. I love that. So you read my mind. I would <laughs> love for you to start talking a little bit about 
how, what are those simple places for people to start? I'm a brand new person to force appreciation strategies. I've got some deals under my belt, but how can I get started? Where do, where do we go from here? What's the, the simplest and easiest way for me to get started? Sure. So what I tend to rep or recommend for people is that look more at the subdivision bucket to start with, because this is going to be where you're going to probably have the best success and the fastest, fastest time frame. And then within the bucket of, of subdivisions, I classify them into three different you know, buckets from there. One is these major subdivisions that I'm referring to. And then there's this middle ground where there's a, what we call minor subdivisions. And be aware that every jurisdiction calls them something different. So I'm just using these as kind of general labels. So you have these major subdivisions that are like the curbs, gutters, sidewalk, dog parks, all that stuff. Then you have these middle subdivisions and they might not have as many improvements Typically, they don't have as many lots, so maybe it's less than six lots or less than five lots. That's all determined by the subdivision regulations for that jurisdiction, so there's not one hard, fast rule, but you need to look at the regulations in the market that you're look, working in so that way you understand where that dividing line is between minor and major subdivisions. So as it implies, minor subdivisions are going to be easier. They still may have a public hearing process. Sometimes they don't, and it's just staff level approval, but those are generally easier than major subdivisions. All that said, there's this other third bucket. There's a place that I suggest everybody starting. And that's where I talk about exempt subdivisions or subdivisions that are accepted from the platting process. And similar to a site plan, a plat is basically just as you guys have probably seen it. It's just a visual depiction looking straight down as if you're in a drone of the property lines of the properties or the lots that you're creating essentially. And so that's a plat and jurisdictions require plats to be required to be um, submitted, reviewed, and then ultimately recorded because what they're looking for is they're looking for opportunities to basically um, have the developer give something in return for that actual subdivision approval. So for example, it might be additional um, roadway frontage, or it might be like, um, you know, fees for like parks dedication or something like that. And so when you go through the plotting process, you're subject to all these additional requirements that come through it. And so if you can do a subdivision without going through that plotting process, that's what you really want to do, theoretically, especially when you're first starting out. So there's about 16 states throughout the country that have some form of platting exception that's attached to it. And those kind of range typically from um, lot, the number of lots that you're creating. So it might say, hey, if you create two lots, then you can be exempt from the platting process. Or if you create four or fewer lots, you're exempt from the platting process. So it might be tied to the number of lots that you're creating. Or the other typical one is more about lot size. So the classic example in Texas is 10 acre lots. So you all may have heard of this. You have hundred acres, you can cut them down into 10, 10 acre lots. And theoretically you just do that through a, through a, a surveyor that does a meets and bounds description. And then they record it at the county. There's a little bit more to that than that, but that's the general idea. And that still applies to a lot of different states. And so Texas has a 10 acre rule. There's South Carolina has a five acre rule, same with Tennessee. And so the point is that these are going to be faster and easier and cheaper to go through that subdivision process. And so that's something that we typically suggest people to do, because again, it's just going to be an easier way to go. Now, people can just have their whole career just doing that. They can go from one county to the next and really do these same types of subdivisions. The one thing I would say is that even though these are statewide regulations, the state usually gives the jurisdiction the authority to actually have their own subdivision regulations. So you can't just assume that in Travis County that you're going to have a 10 acre exemption or in the city of Austin that you're going to have a 10 acre exemption. It's just not going to be the case. There's going to be different rules and regulations. But by and far, for the most part, most of the counties in these states will be apply or will be adhering to those regulations that I'm talking about. What we did a couple of years ago, we went through and actually did an analysis of all 50 states and we said, OK, what are the regulations? What are the exceptions in all 50 states? And we did this whole process and we created basically a document that really lays all that out for us. And um, then we just recently updated it a couple of weeks ago as well. And that's something that's available on our website for, for the public to purchase if they're interested. And basically what that does is it helps guide you which direction you want to go. And for example, California, not so great. Texas is good. Like I mentioned, these other states are good ones and there's a good number of other ones as well. So that's the arena that I would suggest somebody starting in. Excellent. So someone's listening to this and they say, okay, I am sold on subdivisions. Mike, 
what's how do I go about looking for deals that would make good subdivides? What's your criteria for subdivide deals? Sure. The, there's kind of two things at the front that you need to pre-qualify everything. And that is, is there demand for what I'm actually trying to create? In any business, you're creating a product or service, you need to verify that there's actual demand. And so we can go and cut up property all day long, but if there's not demand for what we're creating, then there's really no point in doing it. You're not, you're just going to be sitting out there, right? But you have to be aware of that. So if you're talking about creating 10 acre ranchettes in Texas, is there a market for that? So you got to be working with um, local brokers and realtors, or maybe a whitetail and mossy oak guys that will actually help give you that information, help verify that demand. So that's the first thing. And then with subdivisions, theoretically, this is the second thing is that theoretically on a dollars per acre basis, if you go from the larger um, parent parcel down to the smaller child parcel, the dollars per acre should be higher on that child parcel. That's why we're subdividing these things to begin with. And so that's theoretically the way that it should work, but it doesn't work that way in every single market. So you need to verify that your price per acre actually justifies doing the subdivision at all. You don't want to buy at 10,000 an acre and then only sell at 10,000 an acre. So what's the point of that? So you've got to make sure there's a price differential between the two. So those are the first two things that we look at. And then from there, we try to look at things like job growth or housing shortage, things like that kind of help indicate that this area in general is somewhere where there might be some demand. But however you go about doing it, you need to verify that there's demand there. And then ultimately from there, we're going to look again at the, the platting exception, making sure that there's an exception in place that we like. The other thing you need to really look at too is that there's always going to be a road frontage requirement. So how wide the property is at the county maintained road, that's oftentimes a really big limiting factor. That's why you see these lots that are really narrow and really deep. When you have those have been subdivided down oftentimes as far as they can, because there's a roadway frontage requirement that's equal to or greater than what they actually have. You can't subdivide it any further. So you have enough acreage, but you don't have enough lot frontage. And so that's one of the things that you want to look at too. So having more lot frontage is better. Having it on two different sides of the property is even better still. Speaking of limitations, what are some of the deal killers uh, that, that you would consider to just completely take a deal off of the table if you're looking at a subdivide? Um, anything where I have to force a variance of some sort. A variance is basically like a deviation from the code language that may be like a deviation because you don't have enough lot frontage again, or you don't have enough this or that, and you have to get a variance approved by the planning commissioner city council. It just adds another layer. I wouldn't pursue that just starting out because this makes it more complex. Nowadays, I almost look for those because those are issues that people can't fix that we know how to fix. As you get more experience and you're not as inclined to stay away from those ones. Other ones would be where obviously if the site doesn't perk for some reason, and you can't get an alternative system in there, that would be one, or you can't get a wells in there. Um, another one that we ran into is where um, the topography didn't work to have gravity fed sewer. And so it would require a lift station to be able to do that and push the sewage out to like the manhole to the nearest line. And um, the jurisdiction wasn't in favor of getting those kind of lift stations in place. And so that's problematic. So anything that causes a delay based on the opinion of the jurisdiction, I tend to get a little bit um, concerned about. So anything that kind of causes delays, essentially. Um, so these are some of the things that right off the top that I'll look at and I'll go, yeah, that's really not something that we're interested in. Um, but if you're just doing a very first cursory five second look at it, it's the same type of stuff that you would do this if you're flipping a lot. That's, is there a huge amount of wetlands? Is there a lot of like floodway? Is there a railroad that goes through there? The other thing that will come about too, I highly suggest people do is really always look at doing like a preliminary title search to see about easements that might exist on the property that you're not aware of. And because those easements can actually become problematic for somebody to actually go and build out and develop the property. And that's especially true when you're getting more units on the property than just like one or two houses or something like that. Yeah, that's really good advice. So there's been a, a lot of talk in the real estate industry about market shifts and changing markets. Where do you see the market going now? And how do you foresee that affecting zone changes or subdivides? Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's different than it was back like in 08 and everything like that. I think now the big difference is, is that 
the housing shortage is just exasperated the problem so much where we, we can't build our way out of it for any time in the near future. And that what that's creating is it's creating situations where in a lot of states, they're creating legislation that's going to streamline the development process and get units on the ground. That's what they're trying to do. So they're trying to make the process um, faster. They're trying to make the process easier where the state says, hey, if you do this and this, then you can get your project approved really quickly without maybe going through a, a hearing or whatever. So they're trying to get units on the ground. Local jurisdictions are fighting against that a lot of times because they feel that their, their authority is being taken over by the state. But regardless of that, there's just a huge momentum to get housing units on the ground. And so I think what you're going to see is that maybe instead of like subdivisions with like 7,000 square foot lots, the standard, you know, housing development, you're going to see more dense development. So you'll see multifamily, you'll see um, townhomes, and then you'll see the whole build to rent model too going on a lot too. And so you see that here in Texas for sure. And so I think you're going to see that the demand is still there. And so, yeah, the, the rates will have impacts and everything like that, but it's not as though it's all going to like come to an end. If you're anywhere near in Texas or if you're up here in DFW, you'll see it all over. There's houses that are still being built. And yeah, we're still probably one of the fastest growing areas in the country right now, but still there's still development going on. There's still building going on. And so I'm still optimistic. Yeah, there's changes for sure. There's no doubt about it, but I'm still optimistic because, again, there's such a huge pent up demand for housing and especially affordable housing. So there's still opportunities in those spaces. You just got to chase those down. That's really good insight. That's really good insight. In your opinion, what is something that not very many people are talking about in the land industry that we should be talking about right now? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um. I think within the land industry, I think the things that people, I encourage people to look for opportunities to grow and diversify their skill set. Um, I, I find that there's a lot of focus on the tools and the, the unique things that we can do in the business, whether it be, whether it be, I don't know, like text messaging or ringless voicemail and all these, these strategies and stuff. And I think there needs to be like, at least in a, in a an awareness that the tried and true things are still work. So when we were talking about relationships, those things still work. They're never going to go away. And so as things change within like the marketing scheme of everything, I think these things are still, things are not going to go away. And I would just like, because I see a lot of people that we work with that are really fascinated and fixated on all the new tools, and they can definitely be very useful for sure. But sometimes I think it can paralyze people too. And they're not, they're just not able to go and focus on some core elements of the business. And so I think that's one thing that I see quite often. So it's almost as though I encourage like a, a reversion back in a way to the things that are tried and true. Focus on the fundamentals. Yeah, yep, absolutely. absolutely. Definitely get that. What would you consider to be your, your superpower? Yeah, I've thought about that relatively recently. And I think the one thing that makes me unique ultimately and is a superpower is I'm able to go into these zoning codes that are very complex, understandably. But I spent so many years working in those and actually writing those codes that I can go in and I can find these opportunities really quickly and extract those out. And at the same time, find the constraints as well. And so that's what we always say. The thing that we do is we help land investors identify constraints and then capitalize on opportunities. And we're able to identify those both really quickly and get that information to our people that we work with. I love that. I love that. And do you have any type of thought leader, business owner, entrepreneur that you like to listen to, follow, anything like that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think the ones that I listen to the most are not really in the real estate space, actually, believe it or not. So a lot of times I listen to, what's that, um, Sam Farr and My First Million. Yeah, I listen to them quite a bit. And then I'll go back through like Alex Hormozzi's stuff as well. But I do keep track of things in the land space as well from time to time. But in terms of where I spend most of my time, it's more on those kind of things, I think. I love that. I love that. So what is the biggest surprise you've had so far in your land journey? Wow, biggest surprise. That's a good question. My biggest surprise probably has been the fact that I always assumed that people would understand the things that I knew. I always thought that there would be professionals like real estate agents or developers or stuff like that that would understand this whole world of zoning and land use and everything like that. And I always assumed early on that I was behind the curve. And then I come to find out ultimately that it's just this avenue or this little niche area that most people really don't know about. And understandably so, it's just so nuanced and niched. 
that a lot of people don't know that. And I think I early on, I made the assumption that anybody that's a real estate professional would know that. And ultimately, that wasn't the case. But that was my aha moment, ultimately, where I realized, oh, wow, there is something of significant value that I can offer to people. And that was where my light bulb moment was. Yeah, that's really good. If you could go back and tell yourself three pieces of advice when you were a newbie, what would they be? Um, number one is certainly start sooner. I think that would have been the thing. Like I spent 18 years in planning and it was all great. Um, but I think if I could have, I would have loved to have been start five so or five, so years earlier. That would have been a good thing to be able to do. The other thing too would be really like know yourself and focus on yourself and who you are and not really, not really play to what you hear out in the marketplace in terms of what strategy is the right strategy for you or, or what have you. I think it's ultimately so important to know who you are because you need to be happy with what you're doing. There's no point going out there and making all sorts of money or whatever and being miserable in the process. I'd rather make less money and be a happy person. And so it <laughs> took a while to learn that as well. So I would tell myself to focus on that. And then the last thing too, I'd say is that no matter what, focus on really being of service to people, using my knowledge, skills, and abilities to serve other people as much as I can. And that's where I've been recently is I focus on that. And I let, basically, I let God figure everything else out. That, where I'm at. I love that. And that, it, it's certainly evident coming back to your bringing it full circle, that Zig Ziglar quote in your bio, if you can help other people get what they want, you'll get everything that you want as well. Absolutely. I see that a lot in people that do podcasts and stuff though, too. They have their land business going, but this podcast in that avenue serves as this way to serve other people. And I think that's really cool too. Absolutely. It's definitely a passion project and of service of others for sure. Yep, absolutely. Mike, what is your biggest passion or goal you'd like to achieve at this point in your life? Yeah, I think I get the most joy again about helping other people and helping them actually see these opportunities, but then also bringing them to fruition. And so I think that's really where I get most of my joy. Doing my own projects, is and that's all great and everything, but seeing the light bulb go on for other people, I think has really been like the most enjoyable thing. So people get that light bulb and then to pursue it and help them achieve it. I think that really is like the kind of most satisfying part. It's absolute magic when you see the light bulb and then you see how their world just opens up. Like it's absolute magic. Absolutely. I love that I part. Love it. I love it. I love it. I just want to thank you so much for giving to us today. You've been so generous with your time. How can we give back to you right now? What resources or connections are you currently looking for right now? My whole thing is just really, if you've heard what I've said here today and you think that I can help you in any way, just reach out to me and I'm certainly happy to do that as best I can. I would just encourage everybody too that what I hope out of these kind of calls is that now you start looking at land through a different lens or an additional lens. Look back at your existing inventory and say, hey, is there an opportunity to subdivide, rezone or what have you? How else can I look at this property in a different way? And if you start with that mindset, then you're going to be really well off. So instead of closing yourself down and saying, this can only be this, ask yourself, how can it be something else or what else could it be? And I would just encourage people to do that. And if you have those kind of things, come and chat with me and see if there's a way that I can help clarify and help make it happen for you. I love that. And how can people reach out to you? How can they get in touch with you? Sure. There's really two ways. The best way would be just email me at mike at telosapropertygroup.com. Or you can reach out to me on Facebook and our um, group. It's Forced Appreciation Strategies. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everyone who joined us, Mike. It has been an absolute pleasure. You've just been so generous with your time and information. And I hope everyone got as much value out of it as I did because that was absolutely incredible. You guys, check out Mike. Go in. Uh, you want to work with him. Make sure that you reach out to him. Some wonderful uh, opportunities there. Until then, everyone be safe. Take care and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they built and run their businesses, then check out my group, Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.